I was recently at the Oshkosh Air Show in the United States and they made such a big thing about building a, an aircraft in seven days there. And we thought, let's come back here to South Africa and build a four-seater in four days. So we thought if we're going to better this, we've got to do it faster, do it bigger. And AAD is the perfect place to do it. It's Africa Aerospace and Defense. It's the biggest air show in South Africa. And it's largely our passion that's driving us. And because we're so driven, we're succeeding. Aviation enthusiast and adventurer Mike Blythe never shies away from a crazy challenge. And this time, he and his team take on the task of building a four-seater plane in just four days at South Africa's biggest air show. So we set about working out how long is it going to take to do this, how many staff do we need, and we kind of worked out a formula which we called the Sling 4 440. It's a Sling 4 built in four days using 40 people. They create that spirit that you want to believe in yourself. You believe you can like touch the sky. And then when you got that spirit, then everything is possible. The intention was to work three nights as well as the day. So we had a day shift and a night shift. The first day was stressful. I must say that for me, actually, the build-up has been the most stressful part. It's all about logistics. You, you got to know what to do first and what to do last. Um, and how much effort and how many hours to put in in the beginning. Mike's reputation as an aviation professional and airplane manufacturer is on the line, but he's confident that his highly committed and passionate team will be able to pull it off. A pioneer of early microlight aviation in South Africa, Mike Blythe has been involved in the aircraft business, designing, building, and selling aircraft for over 30 years. Mike is a past aviation world champion and has received numerous awards, both for his contribution to aviation in South Africa and his aviation feats, as well as the films he has made to record them. Today, Mike, together with his partner, James Pittman, are selling their South African designed and manufactured planes around the world. It is an inspiring good news South African story. World-class aircraft being designed and made in South Africa by a passionate team of aviation enthusiasts. I started the business off in 2005. Started developing a light two-seater aircraft from scratch, completely clean sheet of paper, and um, about a year and a half later, James came along. I needed some moral support, technical support, and it's difficult to manage a business like this on your own. Also needed some financial help, and we've been friends for a number of years. He came along and, and joined me in the business. I met Mike at a party, and uh, we hit it off immediately. We were both dressed as women that night, actually. Yeah, the cross-dressing party, and I just want to get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we never really looked back, actually, after we hmm. I got involved with you. I had a lucky break, financially, really, as a lawyer in my previous life. And so I was knocking around looking for something to do. And I'd always been a guy who loved aeroplanes, you know. Um, Mike, of course, was like a kind of hero of mine because he was the first South African microlight piloting world champion. And um, he had these grand plans. So I joined him in 2000 and end of 2007. In of 2000, yeah. Mm. So it was, it was it, I'd been going about two years and you joined me, exactly that. And then we, we, we got the first prototype aircraft into the air. Which I we can both, remember that, 18 October 2008. Both flew. It was like a year later, a year after you joined me. So when we went around the world the first time, we, the first leg essentially was from Pilansburg in South Africa to a place called Sao Tome. We understood that that was the longest straight line flight that had been done in an aircraft that light ever. And as we continued that trip around the world, we kept on kind of breaking our own records and going further and further. Yeah. And in fact, it got easier and easier, didn't it? It did. I think for me, the most memorable flight of all, because it was the first big long flight, fully loaded, first flight at night. And we actually damn nearly, we damn nearly did ourselves in action on that first flight. Yeah. Very close call. And then from there up to Guinea. And then we a, were arrested. We were arrested and we, we were filming at night. We were walking, we yeah. went coming back from a restaurant that we'd been to. And we didn't realize the extent of political instability in Guinea, did yeah. we? I mean, and also the, the people there, but 
you know, particularly the military, are a little bit paranoid. <laughs> and then from uh, from Brazil, we flew up to uh, the British, we, Virgin uh, British U.S. Virgin Islands. A U.S. Virgin Islands. U.S. Virgin Islands, yeah. Islands, and from there up to Miami in Florida in the United States, okay. and then up to the Oshkosh Air Show. The Oshkosh Air Show is where we actually wanted to get to in the first place with that, and it was the most amazing experience because we've got 10,000 aircraft come in there, and for that one week, it's the busiest airport in the world. From there, we flew across to Los Angeles, and then we did another long flight from Los Angeles across to Hawaii, and that was about 22 and a half hours, I think. 22 and a half hours, yeah. yeah it, was, it was about 40 miles shorter, or 30 miles shorter, but we had more headwinds to start, mm -hmm. so it took us longer. In fact. Uh, spent a few days there, and then onto the Marshall Islands, and then through Micronesia, Micronesia, and then we flew into into Sri Lanka. That was a 14-hour flight, and um, and we made the decision to not stay over, but to refuel, file a flight plan, check the weather, and go straight onto the Seychelles which was just going to save us a bit of time on dealing with bureaucracy and looking for hotels and taxis and things like that. And this is one of the times that we flew into very bad weather there. It was like three and a half hours in a storm. Those same human beings would be anything but terrified. <laughs> you don't think stupid or terrified, you know? Ah, uh, okay. So, no, that's better. <laughs> I'd rather be terrified than stupid. There's always this something about the sunrise. I mean, it's got a powerful, like, emotional yeah. significance for humans. I think when we lived in caves, you know, it meant... Well, I think especially after a night of terror. Yeah. You know, a normal, nice, happy night, you know, it's a different <laughs> thing. But a night of terror like we had last night. On the 7th of August 2011, Mike and James flew around the world again, this time in their four-seater Sling 4. They completed 20 legs, some of them exceeding 18 hours of flying, and they had the opportunity to visit 14 countries. So, it was time for a new adventure, and for Mike, building a plane from scratch in four days was the perfect challenge. Is everyone excited or scared? No, no. Excited. 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 Just a little bit scared. Just a little bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> so, the final briefing was done at the factory a day before the build. The work shifts were discussed, and everyone was instructed on how things would be done and who would be doing what. The last of the kits, tools, catering equipment and marketing material were loaded onto the truck and taken to Vatterkloff Air Base. That generator is what's supplying all our electrical power and I hope they plan to run it 24 hours a day. Because if they don't, I'm going to get grumpy. I organised everything. Um, I, I set it up, it was kind of my idea and I felt like there was a lot of pressure on me to make sure that it does get done. I'm not involved in the technical side, I'm not involved in the building side, so I had to kind of relinquish that a bit and say, all right, I'm putting faith in everyone else that you say you can do it, you'll do it. So day one, I was biting my nails. Six fifteen. Wednesday morning, it's the beginning. The day got off to a bit of a slow start, with traffic coming into the Air Force Base being much worse than expected. Instead of kicking off the build at 7.30 sharp, they only got in at 8.30 and started building at 9 a.m. So the pressure started building right from the start. When you consider it is 12 people physically working on the airframe, you realize that 18 precious hours were lost. The cooks were also stuck in traffic, and so breakfast was going to be quite late. Go over the highway. Use it. Chanel and Tanita. Trying to cook us food. We're not going to get food anytime soon. But there was no time to think about food. The team had to make up for lost time. Fortunately, everything was proceeding quite smoothly. The fuselage was taking shape nicely, the engine wiring was coming along at a steady pace, and the panel already had switches and some instruments installed. Support has been fantastic, with lots of people coming to wish the team luck, including the chief of the Senegalese Air Force. So we've been going for an hour, an hour and ten minutes, and we're starting to assemble. We finished with the, um, finished Almost finished with the priming, preparing and priming. Engines going together over here. Everything's looking great. 
The teams have made up for the late start and everything was pretty much on schedule. The rear and center fuselage were married to each other just before the night shift arrived. And the wing kit boxes were opened and priming begun. The engine was completely wired and was fitted to the firewall overnight. The wheels have been assembled, the rudder cables and pedals are in place, and the undercarriage was prepped and ready to slide in as soon as the engine frame was fitted. It's been a sweltering hot day, but everyone was in great spirits. The handover to the night shift went seamlessly with a half hour handover period, meaning that 32 people were working on the plane at once. The plane was beginning to take shape and just seemed to rise up from the work tables. Day one was quite hectic. We didn't really know how long it was going to take on the day one, so we built like hell. And then at 7.30 at night, we changed shifts. The day shift went home, the night shift took over. Now it was up to the night shift to bolt the engine on, have the undercarriage fitted, and start plumbing the tanks. Most of the next day would be spent on building the wings, completing the empennage, and plumbing and wiring the fuselage. The panel was already half-wired, so they should be able to slot it into the dash by mid-afternoon the next day. Very excited. I can see the work is going nice. I think we'll make it tonight. A well-earned break for hearty meals and cold drinks have been welcomed, but everyone seemed so revved up to get this plane built that nobody spent much time relaxing. It's mind-blowing how driven everyone was and how fast they were working. Are you tired now? No, not yet. I think I'll work for eight hours. <laughs> It was another early start on day two, and the day shift workers were picked up from the factory at 4.30 in the morning. When I came back in the morning, on Thursday morning at 7.30 in the morning, I was absolutely blown away. The fuselage was on its undercarriage, the engine was mounted, the panel was in, and we realized we were well ahead of our game. After a quick walk around and inspection, Mike called the staff together and promptly announced that not only were they on track, but they were in fact so far ahead of schedule that there was no need for a night shift that night. How's it? Awesome eggs for breakfast. The day shift jumped right back into action and got back to wiring the engine and the panel and continued with the wings and empennage. Everyone seemed to know exactly what they were doing and what needed to be done next. Truly a well-oiled machine. People passed by and wished the team good luck and expressed their approval and surprise on how far they'd got and how quickly things were progressing. Blows me away. Jeez. But I don't believe there's an engine in there. That's the problem. We're actually managing to achieve so much in... So far, it's only two days. We're nearly, you know, two-thirds of the way through. And I mean, if you look at how complex this is, very, very complex. There's a lot going on here, a lot of wiring. And I see that they've even installed both Ephesus and autopilots and everything, and parachuting. So it's a lot to do. Everything's gone well. We've had one or two parts that have been damaged during the, the, the build. But luckily our factory is only about an hour drive from here, so we've had someone running between the factory and here. They've bought us parts that are broken. And otherwise it's been absolutely fine. I mean, I think the biggest drama we've had so far is a, a flat tire on one of our cars while trying to leave. <laughs> got a puncture caused by Bhutto driving like a taxi drive off mate. <laughs> Despite having worked long hours on the first two days, everyone was elated to be back and set to work doing a quick tidy and clean up before getting stuck in. The final parts of the wings came together effortlessly with the replacement stringer and work continuing on the center fuselage and wiring. Friday was much busier in terms of traffic flow. There were constantly crowds of people standing at the fences watching in awe and offering support and congratulations. It's amazing that they've managed to build such an incredible team after only four years of building slings. All around the site, one could see smiles, hear laughter, and there were no signs of anyone slacking. 
After lunch, it was clear that things were really coming together so well. Gareth had the fuselage moved out of the tent and the wings were prepped to go on. The cowling was fitted and the spats screwed snugly around the wheels. Just before sunset, Mr. T filled the engine with oil and water and started to spin the prop. The lights and strobes were tested and the panel fired up. After a long day, a quick meeting was held to discuss the plans for the weekend. So we see those of you who are working tomorrow, we see you guys tomorrow. Um, the rest of you, thanks very much, guys. Well done, everyone. Okay. Life, really Day four of the Sling 4 440 challenge was full of excitement and fun. Cues to get into the air show were ridiculous though, with some of the team taking two hours to get in, even with exhibitor passes. Once they were in, they got to work on filling the tanks with fuel, putting in the leather interior and sticking the registration letters and decals on. We were uh, 21 on day one, 21 on day two, 17 on day three, and today we eight, eight people. And then one night shift that we did, we were 11 people. So total about 750 hours, um, which is about, we knocked about 100 hours off our normal building time. We're very, very close to finish. We're really doing final inspections at the moment. We need to do a, a, a ground run of the engine. So we need to find somewhere, get permission from the, the Department of Defense to take the aircraft to a quiet corner where we can start the engine and run the engine. And we need to run the engine for at least an hour to make sure that everything is running perfectly, that all the temperatures and pressures are correct, that all the electrics are working correctly. Once we've done that, we then get given what's called a proving flight authority by the South African Civil Aviation Authority. That allows us to then test fly the plane. Now, we've planned to do that tomorrow, which is Sunday, the 21st of September. And um, we don't have a clear time yet, but it'll be sometime between 11 o'clock and 2.30 in the afternoon. We are battling a little bit to get that absolute final approval from the Department of Defense. It seems to be a little bit of a miscommunication between departments. So we're sort of holding thumbs and talking to everyone that we can and everyone that we know to, to see if we can get it to happen. We'd be ready to fly today, but the organizers are uh, not uh, letting us fly today. And we, we'd actually made application only to fly tomorrow. We didn't know how, how early we'd be. We didn't know if we were going to work day and night, day and night or not, you know. But the guys have uh, we got an amazing, amazing team at the factory. And they really, like, work like crazy. Press and camera crews were in and out, one after each other, all vying for a five-minute interview with the team. The publicity and support received from local and international press has been fantastic. With 45 minutes to go on day four, Sling 4440 was rolled out of its built area both wings attached, landing and strobe lights were connected and working, and the avionics were fired up. So it was an absolute fantastic success. Um, on Saturday afternoon, we managed to get the necessary permissions to drag the plane out through the 25,000 strong crowd. The plane made its way through the masses of crowds, right up in front of the flight line to conduct the engine ground runs. Brian Eminez, the announcer, explained to the crowds what they were doing. Athol Franz from African Pilot drummed up some excitement by organizing a photo shoot right out in front of the crowds. And generally, there was a sense of excitement and anticipation. And Mike and James climbed in to start up. Fire extinguisher at hand, final checks done, Mike turned the key and the sling burst to life. With cheers and applause from the crowds, Mike slowly increased the RPM to full power and the Rotex 914UL gave the crowd a taste of an aviation engine at full horses. We want to fly! We want to fly! So the response has been fantastic. Um, you know, a lot of South Africans know who we are quite well and a lot of South Africans are really behind us and support us. We've had quite a lot of publicity in the newspapers about this. The local aviation magazines are fantastic to us. They always print articles about us. Both of the sort of major South African aviation magazines are running spreads on this exact build. Um, and then we've got social media running. There's um, Facebook pages and there's threads on Avcom, which is a local aviation kind of chat forum. 
Um, we're updating our own websites on a daily basis. Our American company is sending out daily press releases to the kind of American press. Um, because this plane we're building is actually for our American company that they can use as their demonstration plane there. Um, in general, people have been blown away by what we've done and, and not only in, how, in terms of how quickly we've done it, but also in terms of the spirit with which we've done it at. Everyone has got a smile on their face and all of our employees are proud of what they do. They love building airplanes and they, they love being at an event like this and sort of showing the world that as South Africans, we are just as capable as anybody else as uh, of making these sort of things, you know, these sort of aircraft. This is no different to one of our production aircraft. Okay. In actual fact, there's more eyes on watching quality and watching that we've got everything right and making sure that um, everything is set correctly and calibrated correctly. We're much more pre precise with it because there's more of us around yeah. at the build than usual. Yeah. But it's exactly the standard as a standard as a production built aircraft. The only difference is it's not painted. At the end of the evening on Saturday, we, we, we dragged the plane back and we had a big group photo and um, everyone had a beer and celebrated a bit. All in all, a fantastic day for the airplane factory and the sling and a great day for the spectators. The next day was the day of the test flight and everyone was nervous in anticipation. And then on Sunday, we really returned 